Ever seen someone with a body like this before? Believe it or not, it wasn't a blast of gamma radiation that transformed this man from human to Hulk, just an innocent diving trip. If you want to find out exactly what happened, plus a shred load of other jaw-dropping facts like the official color of the universe and why lighters actually existed before matches, you'll have to stick around. Stick your feet up and grab the snacks as we delve into another episode of The Ultimate Fact Show. Benjamin Franklin wrote an essay about farts. In 1871, US founding father and all-around brain box Benjamin Franklin momentarily turned his attention to one very serious topic, farting. As the story goes, the Royal Academy of Brussels had called for more scientific papers and, as Franklin thought that the scientific establishment had gotten a bit too uptight recently, he decided to pen a tongue-in-cheek essay titled fart proudly. Although he wasn't entirely serious, Franklin tried to make the essay as realistic as possible by investigating which foods produced what kinds of smells. In the essay, he also lobbied for the discovery of some drug wholesome and not disagreeable to be mixed with our common food or sauces that shall render the natural discharges of wind from our bodies not only inoffensive, but agreeable as perfumes. In other words, the great wordsmith, statesman, and political philosopher wanted scientists to invent a drug that would make farts smell good. There's no word on why Franklin was so utterly offended by the smell of his own farts that he decided to write an entire essay on it but what we do know is that he never actually submitted it. Instead, he printed out several copies and gave them out for friends as a laugh. <laughs> oh, what a jokester. Koala's fingerprints are indistinguishable from humans. Wanna guess what a forensic investigator's worst nightmare might be? The humble koala probably doesn't spring to mind, but any crime scene involving a person and one of these furry marsupials would dumbfound even the most seasoned detective. Why? Because if you were to look at a human fingerprint next to a koala's, you'd hardly be able to tell the difference. Check it out for yourself. Not even careful analysis under a scientific microscope can easily distinguish the loopy, whirling ridges on koala's fingers from our own. Koalas aren't the only non-humans to have fingerprints. Close relatives like chimps and gorillas have them too. But koala prints seem to have evolved totally independently. In fact, primates and modern koalas' marsupial ancestors branched apart about 70 million years ago on the evolutionary tree. Scientists think the koala's fingertips features developed more recently in its evolutionary history because their own relatives like wombats and kangaroos don't have them. So why the prints? Researchers from the University of Adelaide, who first made the discovery in 1996, hypothesized that koalas have fingerprints simply because they can help them grip leaves and branches more easily. One thing's for sure though, these docile, innocent-looking creatures really could get away with murder. Okay, so a koala could probably frame you for a crime, but there's one thing their stubby little fingers can't do, and that's nail that like and subscribe button. Oh, and they probably couldn't play around with the little bell icon to make sure they stay up to date with the latest amazing content either. Why don't you give it a go now and prove you're not just a koala parading as a human viewer? Cowboys never wore cowboy hats. Next up on my list of totally earth-shattering facts, you'd probably go stir-crazy if you traveled back in time to the Wild West in search of a cowboy wearing a wide-brimmed hat. That's right, the iconic 10-gallon cowboy hat you've seen in every Hollywood shoot 'em up movie is a total historical inaccuracy. I'm not saying cowboys didn't wear hats at all, though. In fact, their preferred headgear was something closer to the modern bowler hat, which can even be seen on the heads of famous gunslingers like Bad Masterson and Billy the Kid. The legendary 10-gallon Stetson hat, which was created by American hatter John Stetson, hit the market in 1865, and it didn't become popular until the end of the 19th century. This so-called classic cowboy hat was inspired by the Spanish-derived hat Stetson encountered after he moved to the West, and featured a crease in the middle of a high crown with a dent on each side which allowed the wearer to remove it by the crown instead of the brim. According to legend, Stetson met a cowboy on the road who was so impressed by the hat that he offered $5 for it, which was a big deal at the time. Before then, cowboys in the Wild West would never have chosen such a wide-brimmed hat because it made them easy targets to adversaries. Mary actually had a little lamb. We all know the nursery rhyme, but get this, Mary really did have a little lamb. And yes, its fleece probably was as white as snow. 
The real-life woman was Mary Elizabeth Sawyer, who was born on a farm in Sterling, Massachusetts in 1806. The incident itself occurred in 1815 when nine-year-old Mary and her father came across a sickly newborn lamb in a sheep pen which had been abandoned by its mother. Succumbing to her puppy dog eyes, Mary's father agreed to let her keep the lamb and she nursed it back to health with such adoration that it never left her side. Sometime later, no one knows exactly when, Mary was on her way to school with her brother when the lamb started following them. The siblings apparently didn't try too hard to deter it and even hauled it over a fence on the way. When they arrived, Mary tried to hide her lamb under a blanket beneath her desk, but at some point it popped out, causing hysterics among the other students. The lamb was ushered outside, and the next day another student, John Rulestone, handed Mary a piece of paper with a poem he'd written about the events, titled, Mary Had a Little Lamb. The poem got popular after it was set to music in the late 1800s, and in 1877, it even became the first audio recording in history when Thomas Edison recited it on his newly invented phonograph. Andrew Jackson had a swearing parrot. Apparently, U.S. presidents throughout history have had quite a thing for pet birds. Thomas Jefferson had a mockingbird named Dick, John F. Kennedy had a canary named Robin, and Teddy Roosevelt had a one-legged rooster. But none are quite as famous as the parrot owned by the seventh U.S. president, Andrew Jackson, for one hilariously obscene reason. You see, Jackson's African gray, which was named Pole, had quite a penchant for cursing that was probably passed down by his owner who was so tough as old boots that his own nickname was Old Hickory. Pole was certainly a source of amusement for the president's peers, but he really came into his own when Jackson kicked the bucket on the 8th of June, 1845. When thousands gathered to pay their respects to the fallen president, Pole decided to join in by squawking and swearing so crudely that the foul-mouthed, or should I say beaked, bird had to be removed from the funeral altogether. According to an account written by Reverend William Minifree Norman, who presided at Jackson's funeral, the presidential parrot was excited by the multitude and let loose perfect gusts of cuss words, while guests were horrified and awed at the bird's lack of reverence. Polly wanna what now? A man swelled to twice his normal size after a diving accident. Alejandro Ramos Martinez is a Peruvian fisherman who dives for his catch. But in 2017, a disastrous turn of events transformed him into a real-life version of the Michelin Man. You see, when Martinez came up to the surface too quickly one day, he suffered a nasty case of decompression sickness, which is more commonly known as the bends. The condition occurs when inert gases which have formed in the body swell in size and overwhelm the system during a speedy ascent. When Martinez made the near-fatal mistake of rising too quickly from deep depths, nitrogen bubbles built up in his system and swelled in size, leaving him with an extra 30 kilograms of weight in the form of balloon-like sacs attached to his flesh. This sudden Hulk-like transformation certainly didn't bestow him with any superpowers, though. The growths are extremely painful, and Martinez also suffers from hypertension, which causes abnormally high blood pressure and joint pain. Doctors are working to reduce the sacs in Martinez's body by using a hyperbaric chamber, which has so far reduced the nitrogen by around 30%, but he'll require about 100 more sessions and a $100,000 procedure to restore his body to its original size. The official color of the universe is beige. I know what you're thinking. How can something as vast and unexplored as the universe have a color? And of all the colors, why beige? Back in 2002, a team of astronomers from John Hopkins University set out to understand the star formation process by running a series of tests which collected light samples from 200,000 studied galaxies. By using these spectral analysis readings, they determined that the majority of stars were formed some 5 billion years ago, but they also made another interesting discovery. The same data allowed them to see what color the universe appears from Earth. After doing some working sound using the different samples of light, they concluded that they averaged together to create a beigeish white color with the hex triplet value of FFF8E7. The astronomers cast a vote for the color's official name, but eventually disregarded every other suggestion and settled on Cosmic Latte instead, which sounds like something off the Starbucks secret menu. Apparently, the color is due to how light emitted from distant stars appear down here on our planet as they travel billions of light years to Earth. 
These light waves tend towards pure white due to the light coming from the stars when they were younger and bluer, so maybe the sky is beige after all. Some of the other names that were in the running for the official color of the universe were Cappuccino Cosmico, Univage, Big Bang Buff, and Cosmic Cream. I'm sure some of the creative minds watching this video could come up with some far cooler names though, so why not let me know what you'd call the unique shade in the comments below. Who knows, I might even reply to some of my favorites. Nipple piercing was fashionable in Victorian Britain. The Victorian era is known for being one of the most straight-laced periods in history, so it might surprise you to learn that, beneath all those embroidered capes and corsets, some Victorian women were hiding a saucy little secret. Pierced bosoms. Believe it or not, tasteful gold nipple rings were actually a brief fad among well-bred European socialites in the 1800s, and it's all thanks to the beautiful medieval Queen of France, Isabella of Bavaria. You see, Isabella was a lover of extravagant fashions, and in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, she favored elaborate garments featuring necklines that plunged all the way to the navel. She chose such daring dresses to complement her choice of jewelry, namely, her pierced nipples featuring diamonds connected by delicate chains of pearls and gold. In the 19th century, these so-called bosom rings had a minor resurgence and were considered a stylish and risque way to keep the bosoms in a state of constant excitation. I'll let you figure that one out for yourself. Others saw the piercings as rebellious and the medical community was in uproar because the procedure was seen to inhibit breastfeeding, which was considered the purpose of a woman's body. Next time you think you're being edgy, just remember, the Victorians probably did it first. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was invented by a department store. He may be a staple of the holiday season, but Santa's very own red-nosed reindeer ceased to exist altogether before he was dreamed up by a copywriter for a department store in 1939. That year, executives from Montgomery Ward decided they needed a fun character for the freebie coloring books they were handing out to kids who visited Santa's at their stores. Robert May, a copywriter at the time, was given the task and he managed to create the Rudolph character in the accompanying poem by August 1939 despite his wife tragically dying that summer. In the first year alone, Montgomery Ward gave out 2.4 million copies of the new coloring book, and as the story caught on, customers picked up a further 3.6 million in 1946. It wasn't until a decade later in 1949 that May's own brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, wrote the lyrics for the famous song which was recorded by Gene Autry and went on to sell over 150 million copies. It's hard to imagine Christmas without him, but without these festive brothers, there'd be no such thing as good old Rudy. Lighters existed before matches. What came first, the lighter or the match? Believe it or not, lighters have actually existed since the 17th century. Although they were mostly converted flintlock pistols that used gunpowder rather than something you and I would recognize. In 1823 though, a German chemist named Johann Wolfgang Dobriner created the first sole purpose lighter which became known as the Dobriner's lamp. The device used a simple design, zinc metal reacts with sulfuric acid creating the flammable gas hydrogen that bursts into flame when it meets sparks at the mouth of the container. The device was large and practical and not commercially successful. So it wasn't until Carl R. von Welsbach patented the flint in 1903 that lightweight lighters became more readily available. The first friction matches, on the other hand, weren't invented for another three years until an Englishman named John Walker debuted his Congreve's matches in 1826. But they weren't all that great either. Five years later, Charles Saria of France developed a match that used white phosphorus, but these were so successful that they often ignited by accident. It also turned out that the phosphorus was highly toxic and was slowly poisoning the workers in the match plant, which wasn't too great. It wasn't until the 1900s when the US government forced manufacturers to switch to a non-toxic chemical. Now there's a bar bet you'll probably always win. Shrek was originally Canadian. It's a pretty undisputed fact that DreamWorks is yet to top the cold classic that is Shrek, which was released in 2001. But there was a time when the boisterous green ogre was going to be very different. Instead of ranting about onions in a thick Scottish accent, audiences would probably have watched their favorite sarcastic ogre guzzling maple syrup by the gallon and wooing Princess Fiona with his hockey skills. That's right, 
Mike Myers has since revealed that he originally recorded the voice of Shrek in to sound like himself but with a thicker Canadian twang until he finally saw a rough cut in February 2000 and had a sudden epiphany. Instead of sounding scary and imposing, Myers realized that Shrek's voice needed to show some vulnerability, so he decided to challenge himself with a Scottish accent instead. It may have been a stroke of genius from Myers, but it was a total nightmare for DreamWorks executive Jeffrey Katzenberg, who said that one third of the scenes involving Shrek had already been animated. In the end, Katzenberg reluctantly allowed Myers to re-record his lines, a massive risk that cost about $4 million, or about 10% of the movie's production budget, according to Katzenberg. It all paid off in the end, though. The movie was a hit with movie critics and cinema audiences alike, and we can't imagine Shrek any other way. Turtles don't live inside their shells. Cartoons have probably taught you that turtles and tortoises can proudly pop out of their shells whenever they like. But the reality is that if you try to remove a turtle from its shell, it'll probably die. Contrary to popular belief, a turtle's shell isn't just an empty space where the creature can curl up for a quick nap. Although they can tuck their limbs inside for protection, it's actually an integral part of a turtle's anatomy. Take a look at this shocking cross-section of a tortoise shell and you'll see exactly what I mean. The shell is actually fused to the bones of the skeleton at the ribs and spine, and it even has its own nerve endings, which means they can feel when it's being touched or stroked. Turtles and tortoises don't get to pick which shell they live in either. They're born with them and they grow alongside them, so they're always the perfect size. Think of it this way. Asking a turtle to shimmy out of its shell would be like asking a human to just step out of their skin. It wouldn't be a pleasant experience. Which of these factoids amazed you the most? And do you have any interesting trivia you think I should know? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe to keep your wealth of random knowledge topped up. As always, thanks for watching guys.